Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the board of directors of the Heads Consortium, I would like to welcome you to our 2022 Best Practice Show Showcase celebrating technology innovation for Hispanic success in higher education. My name is Inmaris, and I will be introducing the speakers for this breakout session in this room. Before we begin, we request your support with the following. Please change your mobile phone to silent mode to have your full attention and avoid interruptions. This session is being recorded. For those who are online, please remain muted the uh, same way. This presentation will be in English. We will have time for questions at the end of the presentation. Finally, we invite you to see the QR code that the staff will share to all participants to complete the electronic evaluation form for this session before you leave the room. For those who join us virtually, the link to the evaluation will be available in the chat. I will post it a few times at the end. Please make sure you select the time and date for this session. Your feedback and recommendations are very important to heads. Now we're ready to start. The title of this presentation is Implications of Co-Synchronous Teaching and Learning for Hispanic Student Success. Please welcome our presenters, Dr. Mauricio Cadavid, right? Cadavid. Cadavid, see, <laughs> I, I, say it right. I say it wrong. And Amanda Taylor from California State University, San Bernardino. The floor is yours. Thank you, gracias. All right, welcome. So we do have some people here in um, live. This is going to be fantastic. And I see some people that are actually logging in. My name is Dr. Mauricio Cadavid. I'm a senior instructional designer at Cal State San Bernardino. And I'm going to be co-presenting with um, my really good friend and um, co-worker Amanda Taylor, instructional designer as well. Um, as he would say, the, the title of, the com of this conversation, let's put it conversation instead of presentation, is Implications of Co-Synchronous Teaching. Um, and learning for Hispanic student success. Um, it's going to be, you know, back and forth. Um, I know that we have time at the end for questions, but if there's anything that you're just dying to know at that moment, you know, both Mandy and I are professors, we're okay with just simply raising your hand and asking the question if that's okay. I'll keep an eye on the chat in case that there's um, anything going on. So here we go. Mandy, if you can go to the next slide, please. So a quick introduction, as I mentioned, um, I'm Dr. Mauricio Cadavi. I've been an instructional designer for about 18 years. Um, Mandy um, was uh, a faculty you know, in the English department and she was hired uh, during the pandemic um, because we were so short staff. And um, she is currently getting her uh, master's in instructional uh, design and thinking about doctoral programs, actually applying. So go for it, Mandy. Um, Thanks, I should hear next month. Oh, there you go. Um, and, and the conversation today is going to be about a particular project that we did um, using uh, technology, not technology, an approach, an instructional teaching and learning approach co-synchronous. Uh, co um, we had a lot of difficulties actually finding the definition of what co-synchronous is. So um, we have a working definition that we'll share with you in a little bit. And um, I think I'll just let Mandy give a little bit of an intro of the university just to put this into context, and then we'll go into the actual project of what we did. Right. Sorry, I have too many screens up, so give me just one second. Thank you, Mauricio. It's great to be here. Um, I appreciate the virtual option, and we are actually putting um, co-synchronous into um, action today with the virtual option of, for attendees as well as um, the in-person option. Um, so a little bit about California State University, San Bernardino. Um, it is part of a 23 campus California State University system. We are located near the southern border of San Bernardino County. So you can see on this map near Riverside and Riverside County. This area is known as the Inland Empire of California. Riverside County and San Bernardino County are respectively the fourth and fifth most populous counties in California. San Bernardino County is the largest in geographical area, and Riverside County is the fourth largest in geographical area. <clears throat> and Mauricio, could you unmute so we can hear what's happening in the room? Thanks. Okay. A little bit more of demographics. As shown here, most of our students are fairly local. Um, they come, the primary, primarily come from San Bernardino and Riverside counties. We are primarily a commuter campus although we do have some student housing. 
Um, according to this demographics from fall 2020, 86% of our student body is from San Bernardino and then Riverside counties. 7% are from other parts of California. 6% are international students and less than 1% of our student body is from out of state. As such, our student population represents the general demographics of San Bernardino and Riverside counties. And additionally, CSUSB serves as a community anchor and takes a deep interest in our surrounding area. So things that happen at the university um, deeply uh, affect the surrounding communities and cities. And so um, there is much outreach there and more outreach that can happen. Some further demographics as of fall 2020, 63% of our student body identified as female and 37% as male. And we can also see that 66% of our student body has identified as Hispanic. We are a Hispanic serving institution and any in initiatives we undertake will impact Hispanic students. This project is no exception, although it's more indirect because this is faculty facing first. Um, with this general understanding of our student body, I'm going to turn it back to Mauricio to discuss our projects. Thank you, Mandy. And so, as we probably know, um, based in the southern part of, of California, we have a lot of feeder schools. Um, first generation, <laughs> he was telling me, move that way. Um, a lot of first generation students. Um, currently, the, the university just finally finished, not finally, but um, started doing a Chicano studies um, minor. The reason why this is important is because, it's okay. Uh, the reason why this is important is sometimes we need to put a context into why it is that we're doing the things that we're doing. And although this project comes through the ATI department, which is academic technologies and innovation, um, we know as instructional designers that anything that we do with faculty, right, indirectly affects um, students. And so um, we don't have, specific data on, um, on the faculty, although I know that we have um, a large constituency of um, Hispanic faculty as well. But what we wanted to do is, because of the pandemic, our university is a brick and mortar. Um, I mentioned that in the panel uh, presentation yesterday. And so we never really thought of the scalability of what it would mean um, to have our whole university in, um, you know, and during the pandemic online. And so what happened with this is the project came out because most of our rooms were outdated rooms. Um, and so, and by outdated, I mean, you know, our university is not that old, it's about 60 years old, a little bit over 60 years old, but because we're brick and mortar, there's really no technology, right? Um, only very few number of classrooms uh, were used for televised um, or just, you know, with projectors and big screens and stuff. Coming back, the idea was, um, you know, trying to figure it out what's going to happen with either faculty who um, are not coming online or coming to face to face or students that are choosing uh, to not come or that are sick or that cannot come, etc. What are we going to do? And the first thing that was identified was the fact that um, one day we are going to be back in the university. Um, but things have changed, you know, the way that we're teaching, the way that we are serving our students, things have changed. And so what will happen with those students who, once we come back uh, face to face, are not going to be able to be, you know, with us. And so the idea of let's implement this, this hybrid uh, model, you know, came about, blended instruction, et cetera. We started to realize that we needed better equipment for both instructors to be able to teach as well as for students to be able to participate in class. And so the idea came out to be called the Next Generation Smart Classroom is very similar to this, you know, with speakers in the back and uh, mounted um, camera, you know, with speakers all over the, the, the place, a podium with um, several um, screens in which um, the faculty will be able to be synchronously teaching um, while students uh, were um, asynchronous, not asynchronous, um, virtual or present. Now, I'll talk a little bit about the difference of why we did that, but um, first phase of the project was we need to make sure that faculty are going to get trained to be able to teach live to two different audiences, right? Um, as you know, um, all of those, you know, we have the Zoom fatigue, it's very difficult, especially for faculty, even for me, I was standing over here and I was forgetting that the camera is facing this way. You know, small little things that are not pedagogical, right, but are, you know, uh, practical, which is what do we have to do? So now all of a sudden, you know, having to, quote unquote, 
um, help faculty relearn that they have two different types of audiences. They have the face-to-face -face students in the classroom, and then they have those students that are at home. What happens when a faculty who loves face-to-face -face, you know, is put in front of a computer? You start paying attention to those that are here, right? Their facial expressions, you know, whether or not somebody's you know, falling asleep or on their phone, those students that are at home or at work, right? Turn out their camera or they say that they cannot be on the camera. They think this is going to be recorded. Therefore, I'll watch it later. They're asking a question and I'm completely engaged with the student, you know, talking here and forgetting that there is a chat. And so we realized that in order for those faculty to be able to serve the students, to be able to teach effectively, that we needed to create a program that refocuses, you know, and obviously in academia, we don't like to use the word training when it comes to faculty, right? Uh, but in a way, it's developing new skills, you know, being able to present to a live audience while being able to talk, you know, to that, um, to the audience that is virtual. So that's where the next generation smart classroom came about, which is we need to equip the classrooms, about 300 classrooms were equipped, um, which that um, created some challenges because due to the pandemic, a bunch of uh, monitors that were ordered all of a sudden were out of stock. You know, we had the problems in the, if you were familiar in California with um, the Long Beach port, right? There were a bunch of ships and shipments that were just stuck there for months, you know, post pandemic. And so companies were telling us, I know that you order these mics, you know, I know you order these screens, we don't have them, right? And so we had to adapt and, and readapt, you know, throughout. Um, and as I said, the, the NGSC is because it allows for both, you know, for co-synchronous teaching and learning. And um, I'll leave that there and I'll tell you a little bit um, more in just a sec. Oh, the camera moved. Mandy, next. Oh, there, perfect. So um, those who are either online or here will probably be thinking, well, Marisa, what you're talking about is high flex, right? We were very specific at our campus to, in order to pitch this idea to the faculty, we were very specific that they did not, that we did not call it high flex. Um, reasons being is through the chancellor, so Cal State San Bernardino is part of 23 campuses of uh, the chancellors, the CSU, um, they've been using the high flex. They've been pushing the idea to faculty that, hey, you need to be flexible, which means that we are giving the option to the student. If a student wakes up in the morning and says, I wanna go to class, you know, they're able to. But if a student says, I don't wanna to go to class today and I wanna do this online, then you need to prepare a lesson plan for those students that are not here. You need to prepare, you know, record your, your lectures in a way that, excuse me, will be recorded for asynchronous. That creates an incredible um, load on faculty. We already know how tired faculty are, all of the trainings that have to do. Um, you know, some of these faculty do not have the proper equipment at home, et cetera. So calling it high flex was really a challenge, right? So we went with co-synchronous because co-synchronous is similar to the um, high flex, but it is like there's no asynchronous instruction. Faculty are not in the classroom recording their lectures to later on put you know, online for the students that don't. Um, when the, the live class is happening, if this is a live class, the students that are both in the classroom and at home, you know, there's attendance being called. If the students are not virtually present, then they're marked you know, um, absent. And that relief a little bit of, of pressure from the faculty of having to prepare materials you know, in two, three different formats. And so that seemed to work um, well. However, um, how do we come, you know, how do we present this idea you know, of, of co-synchronous? And so the project was born and uh, Amanda, we go to the next slide. And so we decided that instead of you know, developing you know, trainings that were live trainings, we needed to exercise the principles of instructional design and show faculty, you know, technically speaking, what, not necessarily what it is, but the best practices for using you know, echosynchronous. And so for this, uh, Mandy, you wanna take us through? Sure, and I'm just going to go through some of the best practices. Um, these came from the CSU Chancellor's Office Flexible Teaching Institute um, that we um, both attended. And the Institute freely encouraged us to adapt these ideas for our own use. And also as an instructional design team, uh, we 
um, conferred amongst ourselves about some of the best ways to put um, this space together um, for our faculty and thus our students. So some of the best practices that we found was to first make full use of the course sites in the LMS, whether that's in the learning management system, whether that's Canvas or Blackboard, whatever is being used in the course. Um, this ensures that remote students, students who are attending virtually, and students who are using, who are in the face-to-face -face, um, course um, can access course content equally. So whatever students need to access, whether they're at home or in the classroom is in the learning management system. So if there are paper handouts, there need to be digital handouts um, on the LMS or in the course site um, for students to access, things like that. The second is to create a Zoom link separately for each meeting and office hours so that students know which link they need to attend and to use for which class meeting and what is used for office hours. Third is to avoid using physical whiteboards or chalkboards or writing on things um, in, instead of using the virtual tools. Um, writing on chalkboards, particularly um, with the dark surface and light text, is hard to read on a screen um, if you're watching virtually. And also uh, whiteboards, you would need to make, we discovered that you needed to have pretty much a new marker and you needed to write, um, have a hard touch on the whiteboard in order for the, the ink to show up for students. Um, and it was still hit or miss. So using digital tools such as Zoom whiteboard or Jamboard or other physical note-taking, or sorry, virtual note-taking tools is more helpful. Another thing that you can do is to ask an in-person or face-to-face -face student to monitor Zoom chat. So um, while the instructor is teaching and kind of, um, watching what's happening in the class. You have students monitoring chat to, or helping to monitor chat so that the instructor can also engage the online students, um, those who are attending synchronously. Um, much like Mauricio is watching chat while I speak, I watch while he speaks as well, so that we know um, where there might be questions or comments to be addressed. Um, another best practice is to use polling, Zoom polls or other polls, if you mentioned meter, whatever is being used to engage students, to allow those who are attending synchronously or online to participate in the questions, um, as well as for the in-person students to use their devices or to participate in something where um, you can gather quick data and kind of share those results to the whole class. Um, and finally, to use Google Docs or Google Documents, it could be slides or sheets or anything in the Google Suite for in-time and real-time collaboration. Um, that's a way for students to access material at the same time in the same place. And so even in a synchronous or a co-synchronous co um, situation, um, students can still work together, um, even if they're not physically together. Mandy, before we go to the next slide, we have yes. a question in the audience. Oh, uh, sure. Those are uh, excellent tips. I use most of them. Actually, I, regarding the second one, there's a free app, online app. It's called Calendly. Mm -hmm. That allows you to put your yeah. um, office hours and the students can click on the hours mm -hmm. and put their name, the email, the, the topic of mm -hmm. what is going to be in the meeting about. And then uh, the program will send you a Zoom link to your email and yeah. the student email and a notification in the calendar. Yes. Uh, yes, which is probably more useful. Absolutely, and um, we forgot to mention we're saying LMS. I know that Blackboard sponsors heads, and so we didn't want to be, you know, but we just switched Blackboard to, um, you know, to Canvas. Um, especially the California Community College, you know, is moving towards Canvas and uh, moved to Canvas, and so we were late in moving. But anyways, the point is that um, within there, there was supposed to be a scheduling feature. Right, but we've been using as instructional designers um, Calendly with faculty, and so because faculty have seen us use it, they're like, "Wait a minute, can we use that for my students?" And so we're able to then for them to create a free account, um, and they can actually, you know, for the office hours, they can have a section. If you've never used Calendly, 
um, you can ask questions when the students are uh, requesting your, your meeting, where you can say, what are we going to talk about? And the student can actually say, I have a question about my research paper. I have a question about this that I'd like to talk to. It connects directly with your calendars, be it Outlook or be it Gmail, and it sends a reminder you know, to the students. So that has been very helpful for us as it has been uh, very helpful to, to the students. So that's, uh, that's very wonderful. Mm -hmm. And with regards to Zoom links for each meeting, um, we just moved from regular Zoom to Zoom Pro. And what it does is that within the LMS, when you enable the Zoom link, instead of having to go to your Zoom, create a recurring meeting and copy that link and put it in your courses, when you launch um, Zoom Pro in each of the courses, it recognizes which course it is and it creates a unique link only for those students. This also prevents Zoom bombing Right, um, you know, because then a lot of faculty will have the same link, and students will forget: is today my class or is my office hours? And then start linking and jumping to other people's. With the Zoom Pro, uh, it creates unique links within the course, shows the calendar of the recurring meetings, and students, you know, can actually stay on track with that. So, uh, so thank you very much for for that. Definitely, Calendly has been a tool that we've used, um, and is very. Um, go ahead, Mandy. And now we're oh. actually back to you, Mauricio, to yes. talk about some more of the project. So thanks, Mandy. So first project, uh, first part of the project was, okay, what are we going to do with the classrooms, right? We know what we want to do, um, you know, with regards when we come back, uh, we need to refurbish, you know, the classrooms, we need to give faculty with the tools, you know, that they need. We went through that physical sort of um, um, refurbishing of the classrooms and the equipment and um, stuff like that. Well, now that you have that, we need to work with faculty so that they can learn how to do it. So the second part of the project was um, we needed to create an asynchronous, because this is now for faculty, um, course in Canvas, Learning Management System, is a two hour self-paced course, right? If we have time and later you wanna, you wanna see how it kind of looks, you know, we'll be happy to, uh, to show you. And um, all faculty are enrolled in it in different cohorts. You know, we have a little bit 1200 faculty, I believe. And so we have about three, um, um, sessions of that course with a little bit over 400 um, faculty, they can take it if they want to um, or not. Again, this is self-paced. And so we walk them through what is, you know, the different learning modalities, what co-synchronous is, best practices, um, et cetera. And uh, the last part of the course, it gives them um, guidelines of what it means to actually teach in the, in the classrooms. Part of that so part of the, the, the creation of this um, online course was that they needed to come into the classroom, you know, one of the classrooms that we had originally, let's say like this one, and attend a live presentation of this is what the new podium looks like. Um, this is where you need to, um, you know, to click and this is what it, what it does. And um, we had resources uh, that were created in our website about the next generation smart classroom um, website for, for faculty. Are you clicking on it, um, Andy? Okay. So this was a project that um, started um, early 2021. And because we were supposed to come back for fall, all the classrooms were finally completed um, by, you know, through by the end of, of spring. And then we've had, um, Mandy will show some of the, um, some of the data. Uh, we've had now an uptick in, um, in usage because we are finally starting to come back to, to campus. By the way, this is our website that, that we created for us. So let's go back to the uh, presentation, Mandy. Yep, should okay. be there. Yeah, next slide, please. Okay, and let me pull up my screen. So some of oh, the- Mandy. Oh, yeah. Yep. So bad. I, I forgot to do a little <laughs> uh, segue to that. Um, and that was, that's my fault. Uh, I'm part okay. of it. Um, you know, we're talking about the, the parts of the project. Um, something that I forgot to mention is that originally we were going to give faculty a stipend. However, to give faculty a stipend, you don't just simply give money away. You have to have some sort of requirements. You have to complete this, you have to do this, et cetera. And a lot of faculty decided, wait a minute. Um, I really wanna learn how to use those classrooms. And I really like the idea of this co-synchronous, but I just cannot commit right now. 
So I guess I'm not you know, going to be able to do this. And so after much discussion, it was decided that if you wanted the money, which was $1,500, right, you would attend the, uh, the presentation, the live presentation in the classroom. You would complete a course that Mandy developed is called Essentials of Teaching in Canvas. And you will complete our two hour course, you know, of uh, the best practices in co-synchronous teaching. And you would then speak with your um, chair or dean and then promise in a way, you know, verbally, I guess, before their contract that you would be teaching in an actual classroom that is the next generation classroom, right? When faculty saw all of those requirements and they said $1,500 versus all the things that I got to do, some of them took it. Most of them were like, ah, it's okay. You know, I don't want to do it. So. That's, that's where we are uh, right now. Go ahead, next slide. It's all yours. All right, thank you. So I just want to talk some of the numbers that we have. Um, we are still in preliminary data um, and Mauricio or I will talk about you know, the issue or the problems we've had with data collection. Um, in fall 2021, we had 162 applicants for the NGSC program. We had 142 of those applicants completed the on-site training portion um, of the requirements and 66 of those um, also completed the Canvas course. So with that, 66 completed the full training um, portion. In spring 2022, we have had 28 applicants um, as we have reverted back to um, remote teaching for the next couple of, for the first part of our semester. Um, training is still going. The on-site portion has not happened yet, um, but I do not have numbers for any who have completed the Canvas course at this time. Um, according to our director, Brad Owen, approximately 80% of our 1,100 faculty have taught in a next generation smart classroom, whether or not they've actually had the training. The classrooms are equipped for NGSC use. Um, but we do not currently have any data about how that space has been used, whether or not the technology has actually been used um, the way it has been intended, if it's been used at all, um, or how faculty have been doing in those spaces, at least no formal uh, numbers. We have some anecdotal um, data um, that we have. Um, and we have feedback from about the Canvas course specifically. Um, part of the Canvas course included a course survey um, where we received feedback um, and this survey served as um, part of the completion requirements and proof of completion. So some of the successes that we had with the course, some of the feedback we have is that the course contained a lot of good resources for co-synchronous teaching and kind of explaining what this modality is. Um, so many found that it was useful, um, it was well designed had good tutorials and that it was well organized and easy to follow. Um, we did have some technical glitches that we fixed along the way um, as happens with new courses. Um, and we also received some constructive feedback about the Canvas course portion. Um, several faculty asked for more examples and activities. The kind of the, this is all well and good, but can you give me more things I can do in my classroom? And can you give me more examples of how a co-synchronous course actually works? Um, they asked, some asked for video tutorials. Um, a lot of the course was text-based um, and had, had picture guides and um, visuals, but more video tutorials to actually walk them through um, the space and things that they could do. And there were technical glitches um, as happens. Um, we fixed them as they came up. Um, so we're hoping that if there's another iteration of this course that we can fix that going forward. And then some faculty said that some of the activities felt like busy work, that they weren't sure what the purpose of some of the activities were, was. So um, that's something that we would need to improve upon is making it clear why this activity is being done or perhaps um, be revising the activities that we've had, we've asked um, faculty to do in that course. Um, so that's some of the feedback that we have. And we did have some anecdotal feedback from a faculty member about how students have responded to the space. Um, and this faculty says, some notable feedback from my students. They liked the flexibility and the engagement the NGSC or the Next Generation Smart Classroom provided. They felt they are more engaged and attentive. I noticed more contrib contribution from the remote students. Thank you for making this happen. 
So at least in this one instance, we have clear um, feedback that this was working as intended, that it's doing what we want it to do, that it's allowing that flexibility that we hoped. And that also I infer from this feedback as well that this was a smoother experience for the faculty as well, that they, they were doing, they felt comfortable in this modality and that they were seeing how it helped students as well. So I'm gonna turn it back to Mauricio to talk about some more things. Thank you, Mandy. And so not to get you know deconstructive on the, the, the data that we have, remember that this was a project that um, became uh, you know, organic uh, development is still in implementation. As Mandy and I, we love data. Uh, we've had a little bit of difficulties um, pitching the idea that we need to collect um, student data formally, you know, like have faculty maybe put a survey at the end of the course. Um, at our university, faculty already had surveys for their um, student opinions of teaching effectiveness, and some faculty have felt uh, perhaps resistant to actually ask the students what they felt, what they thought about it, because they believe that it could reflect on their own teaching if they're in a smart classroom and not, um, and not using it. Also, the low numbers, if we were going to interpret it, also has probably something to do with the fact that besides faculty are overworked and overloaded, our office, um, we have quality matters trainings, we have quality of learning and teaching, we have internal certifications you know, for faculty, the essentials of teaching using Canvas is a six hour. Is it six hours, uh, Mandy, or eight? Um, it's intended to be about eight. Um, it it yeah. can be anywhere from six to ten. So, so the, the course that, that Mandy developed uh, for helping faculty with the transition to Canvas is about an eight hour um, course. And some of these faculty through the chancellor's office have also attended um, like QLT certifications. And so when they see our Canvas course, you know, the two hour course, um, some of them may actually feel like I already knew this, you know, the, the, the faculty have gone through all of the things that we've already done, they're overly saturated, you know, sort of with the same message uh, that we're doing and stuff like that. So that's just, you know, to have, you know, as, in, as in, in the back of our minds with regards to when we're collecting that data. So obviously, because this is a project that um, is still being implemented, right? And that's what we're collecting the feedback. We have the next steps uh, of what it is. We're gonna revisit the data once the faculty is back on campus because we have not really have full faculty with full students in full classrooms. Uh, we still do not yet have full data, right? Um, so definitely, uh, definitely once um, everything is completed, once we make sure that um, every single classroom um, is completed, that every single classroom has been used and how it's been used, we'll be able to have more data. Um, as um, anything that we do with regards to uh, making improvements is we need to make sure that we collect better data. Um, not just simply um, anecdotes, you know, from faculty of what they thought, but actually physical usage of, you know, how many of those faculty are in the classrooms, uh, what are they doing, what are their courses, um, et cetera, how they're using the LMS. Um, obviously, we have to make some adjustments to the online course, you know, based on that feedback that we've received. Um, and if we were able to, to create um, um, a student feedback or some sort of survey to collect data from students, we perhaps could be able to um, implement that in the course and say, and tell the faculty, hey, by the way, we've created this section based on what students have said, right? Um, and then uh, some of the lessons learned is um, one of them uh, that I could uh, very clearly, um, you know, sort of point out is we thought, or it was the idea of the refurbishing of the classrooms was thought before the idea of how are we going to train faculty. So it felt sometimes like when, when I came in the, into the project and said, we need to create this course online to train them, the idea of like, oh, we're going to do this with the classrooms. Um, that was backwards design in the worst way possible, right? We needed to think about what are we trying to accomplish? Is this something that is going to be needed? What are we going to do with the faculty that actually do not want to teach? And what are we gonna do um, you know, about the, the, the students? The, the other uh, lesson learned was that um, we didn't have a lot of faculty feedback prior you know, to doing this. We simply did it uh, because we thought this is what was needed for, for the faculty. Um, and then of course we have another lesson learned is that we really need to, I'm a big 
Mandy and I are big um, proponents of finding out what student success really is and asking the students. If these are students that are choosing to be in the classroom physically or choosing to take the class you know, online, right? Um, we need to find that information, you know, better information, be better informed and translate that information to, uh, to the faculty. Do you have anything else, uh, Mandy, to add? No, I think you hit on the most important parts um, or things that we've talked about um, with that. Okay. Thank you. So we could probably go to the next slide. Sure. Which is um, our information. And um, we actually finished, we still have 10 more minutes, yeah. you know, uh, for, for the presentation for those uh, who are online um, or any questions that you have here, if you want to, uh, Mandy, would we be able to pull up the course in Canvas in yep. case? Okay. Actually have it, do we want to look at it now or wait for questions? Perfect, yeah. Oh, and there, there is a question. So maybe while you sure. pull, out, uh, pull it up, um, then sure. we'll... Thank, thank you very much, Julian. Uh, question about, uh, by the way, my name is Paul. I'm Juliana from the Executive Council of the Association of Library Colleges and Universities. Oh, welcome. Oh, wow, what a pleasure. You honor us with your visit. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't hear. Uh, uh, oh. Going back to the, can you hear me now? Call me the map, but okay. Going back to busy work, that the, the classic number who responded, um, less busy work, mm -hmm. and obviously that's in quotation. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I assume, and you mentioned uh, uh, in one or two examples mm -hmm. of what they considered busy work mm -hmm. and what. Have you actually done an analysis to quantify that um, mm. in terms of cat cat categories <coughs> and, per and what would be the highest uh, category of busy work mm. and what would be the lowest category <laughs> of busy work? Have you, has that come up at all? So we have not yet. Okay, uh, we're still recording. In case my boss, hi Brad, in case Brad watches this presentation, you know, the, the <laughs> director. Um, and the reason why is because he has access to the data. Oh. You know, um, as a director, he has access to the data. You know, we ask him, hey Brad, can you give us some data on what we're doing uh, um, and stuff, et cetera. But with regards to, uh, to the BC work, as instructional designers, the course was actually designed for us to ask the faculty, show us that you understand. Mm -hmm. But faculty become reluctant because they see us, they say, I'm the professor, you're the instructional designer. I don't have to prove you or prove to you that I know this. And so some of the, 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 the activities that we had, which is like, okay, now that you've learned how to do uh, uh, subject learning, um, I mean, uh, um, student learning outcome, you know, because we take you through it, Give us one of yours, share it in the discussion so that we know that you know, and they're like, that's busy work. Like, I'm not gonna do that. I don't have to, you know, set up that. But in that section of better understanding better data and, and collecting better data, Mandy and I have had coffee conversations with regards to what can we actually do? How can we interpret this data? How can we actually um, get numbers and, and the context for those numbers? Because numbers by themselves, are um, you know they don't mean anything. So we have thought about it, and when we when we wrote there about in making improvements, um, one of the things that that we could do is have a more personalized. Remember, this is asynchronous, mm -hmm. so we don't know when the faculty are on it, right? They're not contact, contacting us. We're assuming that they're actually going through the course. We we designed it with the idea that they're not simply going to click and click and click but there needed to be participation and engagement, right? I mean, we're putting instructional design principles into it, but there's gotta be perhaps more engagement between the faculty that are taking the courses and the instructional designers to understand what is your actual experience with it, right? I mean, in a way, by doing this, the way that we did it, um, the benefits of it, do it on your own time, right? Take your, take your own time and, and don't feel that you're being sort of observed and watched. 
But at the same time, it removed us and it removed the conversation about what is effective teaching, you know, what is effective learning, um, why we did it the way that we did it, et cetera. So yeah, those are the things that go through our, our, our minds um, for this. So I appreciate your, your question. Mandy, did you have anything to add? Um, I was just going to say, um, as you were talking about that, um, we've also been discussing kind of summer institutes or academies that we might have, and this might be something we consider offering a one day or a two day kind of here's the NGSC um, classroom, here's how it works, and you know, be allow time for them to do some of that work while we're there or we have that conversation together, kind of moving through the Canvas course or just kind of an in-class activity kind of thing. Um, either a synchronous or a co-synchronous um, modality to even teach that class or to have that that institute. So something we'll continue to think about and um, and work through. But um, as far as what was some of that busy work, we didn't quantify it, but some um, specifically mentioned some of the discussion boards. Um, it was like they, they didn't want to do the discussion boards um, that we asked them to do. Um, so which is kind of an across the board student thing. Um, when you're in a student position, I didn't, I'm not very fond of discussion boards myself as a student. So I fully understand where they're coming from. Um, and given the time frame and when this was produced and when we were all working, we're still under, we're still under pandemic stress, but this was something new on top of that already. And so it's just like, just let me get done and do the thing that I need to do. Was, is kind of how it felt as well um, for the faculty responding. And with, thank you, Mandy. And with regards to putting things under context, um, something that we didn't mention, you know, we'll do it in this last three or four minutes unless there are other questions, is our campus went from three or four years of planning of transitioning from a quarter system to a semester system mm -hmm. that got postponed from 2019. We were supposed to have our first semester 2019 and it got moved to the fall semester 2020. of 2020 before we knew about COVID. In that process, we were also in the middle of transitioning from Blackboard to Canvas. And in that process, we were in the middle of refurbishing classrooms. So the pandemic hit. And so to ask a faculty engage in a discussion board online that nobody may read, but just mm -hmm. us, mm -hmm. would be like, no. Like I'm already preparing yes. for a semester class to do it in Zoom, you know, and now you're telling me to do this and stuff. So again, that's part of putting things into the context. Yep. Um, and stuff. So any other questions or comments, or if you wanted to take a very quickly a, a look at how the Canvas course, because I know that we didn't really talk about some of the elements, but it could be helpful. Yes. Um, uh, quick question. It's not linked to your main point. What's the reason for the decision to switch from Blackboard to Canvas? Several, um, several uh, decisions, or several reasons for the decisions. The more diplomatic ones that I can provide is the fact that uh, Blackboard is an obsolete LMS with regards to um, how it functions. And um, our, at our university, we're moving a lot of things to the cloud. And so um, Blackboard was moving from Blackboard to Blackboard Ultra. We did a pilot of Blackboard Ultra and we had really bad experiences with it from a student's perspective and from um, faculty perspective with regards to how it functions. And then the other one is, um, uh, Myra. Thank you, Myra. And then the other one is, um, as I mentioned, the community college system, the whole community college system in California moved to, to Canvas. Because we are a feeder school, we have faculty, adjunct faculty, you know, that are teaching one class for us, one class for the community college, another class for another university. And then we have students that are coming from either high school or the community college. Everybody else seemed to be in Canvas and they had to now learn a different system, Blackboard, which, you know, sort of clunky. And so um, out of the 23 campuses in the system, a majority of those campuses had already moved to Canvas. Right. And so we had data from them with regards to how it's working and why they did it um, and then why we did. We also did uh, a pilot, um, a semester pilot with uh, with Canvas, and it was presented to an executive committee. It's called Academic Technologies uh, of Distributed Learning, uh, ADTL, um, and they report to Academic Senate, you know, with regards to Canvas as a product itself is superior with regards to um, the social component of it, how simple it is, and because it is uh, mobile ready, 
you know, so students can actually um, use Canvas better on their iPads or their phones than they could, you know, with, uh, with Blackboard. So I hope I do not get in trouble with that. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's see. So thank you, Alma. Thank you, uh, Myra. And if you are still here and you still want to take a look at it before the next, uh, what time is the next presentation? Uh, no, it's at 2.30. Right now is the Q&A session. We have okay. from 2.15 to 2.25. So okay, we so we have 10 more minutes. And if you still want to see how the Canvas course looks, we can just give you a quick tour. Perfect. Okay, uh, okay. go ahead, Mandy. Do you want student view or instructor view? <laughs> uh, instructor would be nice. Yeah, let's okay, let's sure. see with the instructions so we can actually go to the modules and they can they get to see. Um... Okay, well, I I can provide the showing of if you want to talk through it because you actually designed it. So okay, so uh, three modules. Uh, the first, and remember, this is a, an adaptation of the high flex model that the chancellor of the university was uh, was pushing. And so the first module was sort of like, okay, let's think about what is co synchronous teaching. Um, you know, for, for faculty to understand that they were not going to be required to do um, blended or uh, flipped, you know, um, that this is going to be live, you know, faculty is live, the students are virtual, um, either live or um, in person, but the faculty didn't have to create, you know, um, pre-recorded lessons for the students or have asynchronous learning for the students. This was going to be a live class they just happen to have two different audiences, right? And that's kind of like that the, the, the gist of it. Um, we, um, as you can see, the, the, when we have those uh, check-ins with yourselves, this were some of those um, asking faculty to reflect on their own teaching practices, um, you know, and there were quizzes, um, et cetera. And so this is perhaps what some of them were thinking about, like, I don't really wanna talk about what I think about teaching. I just, I know what I think about teaching, right? The reason why we thought about this, um, it's because if you know what your philosophy of teaching is, it is easier for us to help you transmit that with what we do you know, um, online. So module one, which is let's set the expectations, let's define the terminology. Um, can you click on the define terminology for teaching and learning modalities? Sure. Thank you. Um, by the way, as you can see, um, I'm going to have to step out really quick uh, to show those in here. Um, this first part of the modules is something that we are using to, oh, thank you. Okay. Professor Amy has to be in front of the <laughs> room, is um, setting up the outcomes. Um, remember, we instructional designers, so we also put a little bit of ourselves in here, right, uh, to help faculty go through, which is why do we do what we want to do? What's the reason that we're doing what we're doing? Why are we doing it? And how are we going to accomplish what we're gonna do? So each of the modules walk the faculty to, this is what it is, this is why, you know, uh, the research, et cetera, and this is how we're going to, to be able to do it. And then we gave them, uh, we, we believe, Mandy and I, by the way, my, Mandy came in a few weeks after I had started to put things together, and her being an English professor, she was like, Miss, do you want me to use red ink? You know, let's edit some of these things, please. <laughs> so thanks to her. There you go. Uh, she just loves that. You just got to love that. Um, so terminology was very important, right? Um, especially because even in this room, if I were to ask, um, what is uh, um, asynchronous teaching? Some people are going to say, well, I think it is this. Well, I think it is that. So we define what synchronous learning and teaching, asynchronous, hybrid, flipped. And then we said, now that you know what those are, this is what we want you to do. This is what co-synchronous is. Because if you go to Google or Google Scholar and then you, you type co-synchronous, there'll be like two or three articles from K-12. Like it's a term that we've been using and we know about it, but there's really not much. So we define what co-synchronous uh, learning and teaching was, but once we had set that up, then uh, we can continue with the course. So we can go back to the uh, modules, uh, Mandy. Got it. Okay. The, uh, the first module, by the way, if you're not familiar with, uh, with Canvas, uh, one of the things that we did, as you can notice, 
He's got prerequisites. You can set up prerequisites of modules. Um, again, this is part of us helping the faculty also understand, hey, if you, not hey, sorry, I'm, I became too casual there. Um, you know, professor, if you want to make sure that the students do not jump around and, and you want them to go in a, a sequential format uh, for your courses, um, Canvas allows you to do prerequisites so that if students have not completed a discussion or have not completed a reading, they won't have access to some of the things. So we use that there. And then Canvas also has an option which you let Canvas know that you're done. That's right. So we were using this again as practice. So we were putting the faculty in the student's perspective, you know, while learning something. And so while they're they're doing their thing, they'll be able to click and say complete. Um, and then that was also part of our data collection. So that when we check to see what faculty have done and when they had done it, oh, she's showing you, see the check marks at the end? So there's canvas. And then it says Martha's done here at the bottom. Right, so if you wanna if you wanna sort of encourage your students that hey, you might just think you're gonna sit there and click next, click next, click next. Well, by the way, there's which that shows that if you have your students do a physical some sort of physical action during online learning, that they'll be more engaged. And then you start showing what they have or they have not done before they can actually move on. Uh, so all of this is part of also helping the faculty understand Canvas because remember we were a Blackboard uh, campus. So we were using Canvas to demonstrate what Canvas is while using Canvas to develop a course for faculty to know, you know um, how to work. And then the last, uh, the last module, because um, we are running out of time, is now let's put everything together. And we created some, um, oh, I'm glad. Thank you, Martha. <laughs> um, uh, the last module had to do with um, go to the best practice 2.1. And so um, one of the things that we are very big on, and by we, I mean mostly, you know, Andy and I, is we understand that there's differences between best practices in teaching and best practices in learning, right? Just because you're a good teacher, teacher doesn't mean that you're doing the right things for students to learn, right? And so we also put, you know, co-synchronous teaching technologies, you know, so the technology component and then the teaching technology to get faculty, you know, um, thinking about and, and this goes back to what is your philosophy are you a type of teacher that likes you know um student center you know sort of learning so do you like to just simply do lectures and just stand in the back and lecture and through this last portion is like um taking them back to the idea that uh, one technology is just but a tool right um technology use and effectiveness is only or technology is only as effective as you're able to use it right um, and that we don't want technology, you know, to be a barrier between what you're teaching and what students are learning, right? Um, and then the last thing, I think, Mandy, in the mod modules. Sure. What about the testing? Testing to, to for professors to see um, What was? So the question, the, the question was going to get me in hot water. <laughs> because remember, remember how we had the testing for comprehension, yes. and then it became too much of um, us questioning the faculty if they were learning, and so that got removed. Sorry. Um, well, we did have in the uh, check with yourself uh -huh. if a faculty actually took the time to do everything. Yes, we would be able to see. You know, if a faculty in the first module said, I really don't know what this is. Uh -huh. And at the end of the module, they were able to give us a sample syllabus, you know, of how they're planning to introduce technology, um, then we would have seen, you know, because, yeah, uh, Mandy and I are dat data people, and we had a bunch of things here that were scratched, you know, so, um, but, you know, we do have the knowledge checks, right, uh, which is like, let's see if you actually did read. <laughs> instead of just checking complete right sort of thing uh, which i think is probably affecting some of this faculty feeling that we're treating them like students i'll be more than i'll be more than happy to if you have any other questions you know outside thank you so much for that thank you for the participation thank you everybody for attending and mandy from california waking up so early to do this um thank you thank you thank you, you have to say anything to, oh, hold on. I will thank you for attending and